welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm sitting here listening to that piano. This is a young man. I'm so gifted. And I'll be honest with you. I believe that when I get to heaven, I'll be able to play like that. That was beautiful. If you were paying attention to this power in the blood, um, a jazzy um, rendition of, of, of a young man um, and a, a powerful, powerful um, rendition. I just, you saw me, I was in the groove and I, I just want to welcome you because when I get to heaven, I want to play just like that when I get there. I look forward to being there and I want to welcome you today. I am so glad that you're with us today. Today, we're looking at lesson number two in the theme this quarter, the next 13 weeks, all 13 weeks is the great controversy between good and evil. And we talked about the basis and the foundation last week where all of the wars started. They, if you remember, we talked about they started in heaven, interestingly enough. But today, the we want to deal with the central issue. Is it love or is it selfishness? And we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 19, Acts, Luke chapter 19, Acts chapters 2 through 5, and Hebrews chapter 11. Um, the central issue, love or selfishness. And I just want to welcome you wherever you are. If it's morning where you are, good morning. If it's the afternoon, good afternoon. Um, I am excited. If it's evening where you are, good evening. And welcome to um, Deeper, year number two, the great controversy. This lesson is entitled, The Central Issue. I am excited to be with you, um, and I thank God for each and every one of you. Um, I want to introduce our panelists today. Hey, let's go say hello to everybody. Julie, Greg, how are you guys doing? How is everything? Where are you at? Hi, praise the Lord. It's a beautiful day here in Texas, and I am very, very excited about the lesson today. Love mm -hmm. or selflessness? That's the question. That's right. That's Amen. Right. That's right. It's real nice here in South Carolina today, too, for a change. Uh <laughs> Very, very, very good lesson that we're coming up, uh, up on today. So keep your ears open. Mm. You're going to learn something good today. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I, too, it was beautiful out today. In fact, um, for those of you who know me, um, today my church went out into the community. We didn't have church inside the doors. We went out to the community, and we fed over 100 and something people. Um, we passed out literatures. We gave out recipes for healthy living. Um, we interacted with um, hundreds of people. We are bringing children's church to the community where a um, couple of times a, year, a month, two times a month, we're inviting the children from the community to come and have church in a separate building other than the rest of us. And the children will be there. They'll be having church by themselves. They'll be learning Bible stories. Um, there'll be arts and crafts, snacks. They're going to be going to be teaching them manners because we believe that if we don't reach this generation, the younger we reach them, the better. If we don't reach this generation, we're going to lose a generation. So we want to try to reach to the community. So that's what we went. We went out all day. That's why you don't see me in a suit today. I'm in a regular polo. We were out in the community. We had a great time. And I'm excited to be with you guys today. Beautiful Amen. weather. It must have been about 79, 80 degrees. I mean, it was just beautiful. Hundreds of people in the in the, in the the park where we had the um, uh, event. It was a magnificent time. The food was delicious. The food was good. The fellowship. I'm just excited. I'm I'm overjoyed. Um, and I want to deal with this Sabbath school lesson. Let's go quickly. Um, if you rem if you if you don't know this, but I've been I started working on this quarter's lesson on uh, Easter Easter weekend, if you want to call it Easter weekend. Um, I can I because I couldn't understand how much God loved us, and how I mean it just blows my mind when I think about Him dying for me. Because you see, you guys don't know me, but I know me. <laughs> so for Him to die for me blows my mind. And if you remember last week, we talked about that the war in heaven and the conflict between God and Satan was over the allegiance of Adam and Eve. And we talked about how was Satan doing at that time against God. And we discussed that Satan was actually doing pretty well. He, he actually convinced one third of the angels and the humans to follow him. And so the question needs to be asked. So if you were God, what would you have done? Would you by power through this problem, destroy Satan and all of his followers? zap them and start all over or would you sacrifice yourself um astonishing even to the human mind and that's why it blows my mind that god would decide not to zap satan and all of his followers but to show his love by sacrificing himself so let's go right in there let's talk about this love in our lesson let's bow our heads and go right into our lesson another amazing lesson about god's love let's pray loving father again we are so thankful for your goodness, your kindness, 
and your mercy. And Lord, we, we, we don't dare open your word without your spirit. So speak to us in urgent simplicity, and we will give you all the honor, the glory, and the praise. Bless those who are listening today live and those who will listen in the future. We pray that everybody would get a closer, deeper walk with you, which would in turn get us to dig deeper into your word. For this is our prayer in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. And amen. Let's go right to our lesson. We're going to talk with he wept. That's where we're going to start. And you're probably saying, what do you mean he wept? So let's go there. Luke chapter 19, verse 36, 37, and 38. Somebody read that for us. Uh, and I'm reading from the NIV version. As he went <laughs> along, people spread co cloaks of the, on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. So Jesus is riding into Jerusalem triumphantly, right? What, yeah. do, the me what do the people mean by calling Jesus the king who comes in the name of the Lord? What's well, actually going on? He's saying, uh, they're saying that Jesus is the Messiah. They're calling him the expected Messiah and King, it sounds like. So, so, so at this point, they're thinking they're this is him. He's here. The Messiah yeah. is here. That's what's going on. Now look at verse 30, 39 and 40. 39 and 40. 39 and 40 says, with some of the Pharisees among the crowd say, teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. Mm. He replied, if they kept quiet, the stones along the road would burst into cheers. Right. Mm. So now follow now. The people of Jerusalem are saying this is the Messiah. The religious people are saying, man, you should, you should, you should do something to them for calling you the Messiah. Man, how dare they talk about you like that? You should rebuke them and put them in their place. And Jesus turns around and says, hey, if they don't say something, rocks are going to cry out. What did Jesus mean by that when he says the stones will cry out? What would cause the stones to cry out? He was saying that praises would come from supernatural sources. You know, and, that, and he's confirming that he's the Messiah. Right. He's, he's saying, listen, I can make anything in this place talk if I wanted to. Right. And basically, he's, like you said, using, he's saying, I could have, I could have, voices come out of the rocks if I wanted to because I am the Messiah, the one that they're claiming that I am. You guys don't yeah. believe it, but I am him. Yeah. Now let's read verse 41 and 42. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what should bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. Mm. He says, you, you, if you only knew. Who's the you he's talking about? They're longing for this, peace. Who is this you? The citizens of that city. The people who lived in that city. What peace is Jesus talking about? Is he talking about peace with God? Talking about peace with one another? What is he saying? He said, you guys want peace, but if you knew, if you only knew what you're talking about, what peace is Jesus speaking about? If only the new had only understood, what would you do? <coughs> well, he's talking about his peace, God's peace, the peace that only comes from him. No, what, the people are, what's what's happening What's happening to Jesus' followers right at this time? They're being persecuted by the they're Romans. Being, okay. So well, he's talking about peace. What peace is, what is, is he it? talking about? He's talking about Ooh. peace with the Romans. Okay, we were the talking about the, them, the people, people who have them oppressed. Well, I'm a little bit confused. I'm sorry, but we were sure, talking sure. about look at look at look at Luke look at Luke 19, verse 43 and 44. 30, uh, Luke 19, 43 and 44 says, "Before long, your enemies will build ramparts against your walls and encircle you and close you in from every side." They will crush you into the ground and your children with you. Your enemies will not leave a single stone in place because you did not recognize it when God visited you. Right. So 
So Jesus is saying there's a visitation that's coming. He's referring to what? The Romans attacking Jerusalem and destroying Jerusalem. Jerusalem. So okay, who's the yeah. who's he who's he saying your enemies when he says the enemies before and he's talking to the people in the city he's talking about giving them the peace with the Romans because the Romans are destroying they're attacking them they they're, they're okay. trying to destroy them they're trying to kill them and Jesus is talking about I want to give you peace not peace that comes that passes understanding but the, they're dealing right. with the the Roman oppression right now right and the Jews did not did not know while it was going on, that the, Jeru the, the the temple was going to be destroyed. Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. They didn't yeah, know what no. was going on. No. <coughs> they just knew that Jesus had told them it was going to happen, but they didn't know when. Right. And Jesus is now saying, you didn't recognize me, and you didn't realize that I was the Messiah, but the stones recognized it. But God's people didn't. Wow. Let's go back to verse 38. Look at Luke, look at Luke 19, verse 38. 38. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Right. Notice the reference to peace where? In heaven. He's talking about peace in heaven. You remember our discussion last week? Mm-hmm. What went on? What happened in, in heaven? There was a great battle. There was a the... great war. There was a great yeah. battle in heaven. Yeah. So Jesus' act of giving up himself not only won the war here on earth, it uh -huh. settled the issue. Well, in heaven, yeah. In heaven as well. And all the yeah. universe. Because remember, one third of the angels went with Luc the devil, the Lucifer. Mm-hmm. And there must have been questions like, whoa, what's next? Now, wait a second here. So there was all kinds of unrest and all kinds of anxiety and questions. So Jesus' death not only brought peace here on earth, but it brought peace in heaven because now the angels realized, man, this God loved them so much. Mm. He was willing to do anything. Maybe this Satan guy, Lucifer guy is a liar. Because he's saying God is so hard, he's so this, he's so that. Right, and God right. came here and died for these people who, who turned their back on him. Wow. So this has not only been settled here on planet Earth, but also in heaven he brings peace. Wow. Let's go back to verse 41. Verse 41. 41 says, But as he came closer to Jerusalem and saw the city ahead, he began to weep. So, 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 so the people have rejected him, right? They don't even yes. know who he is. They've, they're, they're saying, you know what? You're not the Messiah. His, I'm talking about Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And I want to ask you an honest question, Greg and Julie, and those of you who are listening. If somebody rejected you, would you weep about it? Or would that make you angry? Would you start crying? Or would that make you angry and want to, want to, want to? <laughs> no, nah, it depends the, on the who human, rejected The human you. in us will make us angry. The human in us would make I, us angry, and you said it depends on what, Julie. I think I, for me, it would depend on who was rejecting me. If it was somebody that I truly loved, I would feel really sad. I wouldn't be angry. I'd be very sad. And Jesus shows his love, his compassion, by crying over the coming loss of his people. He knew, you know what? These people were going to reject me. These people were not going to give up everything for me. They're not willing to believe that I am the Messiah. And it hurt his heart. He, he started to cry as opposed to getting angry. Now, the human side of us, like Greg said, probably if somebody rejects us, makes fun of us, or turns their back on us, uses us, that's what usually happens, but not Jesus. Jesus saw the people's rejection, and he said, you know what? I'm going to show them who I really am. And when he saw the crowd, the Bible says he actually cried over the loss of his people. Now let's go back to verse 43 and 44 again. The day will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you on every side. They will dash you to the ground 
you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Right. So who's doing the destruction? Who's who's doing the destroying? According to the text. The Romans. The, the, but it just says the enemies, right? The enemies, it says. We know yes. the enemies the are the Romans, but it was uh, the enemies. But Satan mm -hmm. is behind the attack, though. Right, but the truth is that Satan is just using the Romans, but uh -huh. it's Satan who's behind the attack. Right. Attacking mm -hmm. God's children. He says enemies, but it's because he is the enemy of our souls. That's the truth always. Right, Satan is behind this, and that's why we should never get mad with people because Satan is just using people to do what yeah. he wants to do so he gets yeah. off scot-free. Yeah. How does that work? Jesus has love for the people, right? He's crying for the people. He's dying for the people, and Satan destroys them. Even children, the text says. Why? So when the people rejected Jesus, they also rejected the protection that Jesus is going to give them. When we decide, and it's always our choice, when we decide we're not going to do what God says, then God is not going to stand up for us or protect do? us when we don't want his protection, when we, we don't, don't want, want his, 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 his love. God is never going to force us to try to love him. God is never going to force us to surrender to him. He's always going to try to love us. How do I say this? Love us to death. I think, and I think that what, that's one of the things that happened in heaven. You know, if he, if he would have destroyed Satan, then the angels might have just said, well, we better do the right thing because, you know, out of fear, they might have worshipped God. He didn't want that. Correct. He wanted willingly and loving for us to love him because we choose to love him. And that's why he didn't destroy Lucifer, all those angels, because he wanted it to right. play out. He right. wanted the whole universe to see what happens, number one, when you reject God, and number two, how does God respond when you reject him? It's always going to be in out of love, in his love. Amen. Let's go to Matthew chapter 24. And somebody read verses 15 through 20. Matthew chapter 24, verse 15 through 20. I'm reading this from the <clears throat> And it says, mm -hmm. The day is coming when you will see what Daniel the prophet spoke about. The sacrilegious object that causes de desecration standing in the holy place. Then those in Judea must flee to the hills. A person out on the deck of the roof must not go down into the house to pack. A person in the field must not return even to get a coat. How terrible it will be for a pregnant woman and for a nursing mother in those days. And I pray that your flight will not be in the winter or on the Sabbath day. Mm. Who's Jesus talking to here? Who's he trying to save? The, the Christians that are listening to him. The, the believers that are listening to him and who are, who are, who are following him. And, 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 and in other words, the believers. Those who believe him. Right. Because the people who didn't believe him, he wasn't talking to them. He's talking to the believers, those who, that's who he's trying to save, the ones who will listen, who will follow, who will surrender, who will um, follow him and believe in him. Mm -hmm. Eusebius and Epiphanius, who were fourth century church fathers, report that Christians in Jerusalem saw a chance to leave after this Roman siege began. When the Roman attack came, the Christians, according to the historians and the early church fathers, the Christians saw as an opportunity to leave. Um, and so following Jesus' instructions, because what did he say? He said, get out of there and pray that it doesn't happen in winter or on the winter Sabbath. The they left the city and they were saved. Mm -hmm. Now I want you to keep your hand there. Keep your head there. They're in the city. Jesus tells them, get out of there because your enemies are going to destroy it and they get out and they're spared. Now let's rat, read Acts chapter one and verse six. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? So 
What did they think about the future of Jerusalem? They thought it was going to be restored. And so, in other words, they didn't understand what Jesus was trying to teach them all along. No. No. No, because no, he because... said the temple is going to be destroyed, and there's going to be another one, but it's the one that's coming when he comes back. They right. were looking for Jesus to fix everything right then and there while they were there. They mm -hmm. they obviously did not understand about the future of Jerusalem. Now let's talk about all of the texts we've talked about so far to see a, dip, a deeper picture. What is straighten, What is Satan's strategy in all of this? How, what what is he what has he done in this big picture? What has Satan done? There's two things that he does. What is the first thing he does? Well, the first thing you know he persuades. Mm. The the first thing he does is he persuades the people to reject to do reject Christ. Right. The first thing he does is he get people not to believe in Jesus, even though. Nature, the stones knew it, the people didn't get it. What's his second strategy? What happens next? So he gets them not to believe in the Messiah, not to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, not to believe in Jesus. That's the first thing he does. And what's the next thing he does? I mean, he chose that he tried to destroy those who chosen him. Right. He's then he goes after the Facebook ones who choose Jesus and he tries to destroy them. Yeah, because what is he trying to do? Personally. He's trying to dis he's trying to because if he catches if he if he if Satan can kill you while you're in your mess, your 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 destiny is sealed forever. Yeah, yeah. And that's what he does. He wants you to not believe in Jesus, and then he wants to try to kill you before you can get to Jesus. Mm -mm -mm. Right. And now the people don't understand about the temple, why it's being rebuilt, when it's being rebuilt. And the truth is, it has, it has never been rebuilt. No. Why does that serve Satan's purposes, that the temple never was rebuilt? Think about it. Well, I mean, it's terribly discouraging using to the descendants of Abraham. Right. If you're Abraham's you know, seed, they, 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 and you've been talking about a promise coming, and you've been talking about Jerusalem coming, right. and all of this stuff, and it still hasn't come, and it hasn't come, and then, then, then if then, then they destroy the one that was there, and it hasn't mm -hmm. been rebuilt. It would become discouraging. Yeah, it would become like, man, is this true? Can we really believe this? Does that sound like anything that's going on today? Mm. Yes. You know, we've been talking about the second coming of Jesus since 1844 and 1830s. This is 2024, and you got some people, church folk. Who are saying, man, don't you think we should change our view about Jesus, whether he's, whether or not he's really coming back? Mm, yeah. And that's what was going on then. They began to say, eh, I, I don't know. And they began to be get discouraged. And they didn't, they were confused. They didn't want to believe. Um, uh, they, they didn't know if they could believe. And they eventually didn't accept Jesus as the Messiah. Mm. So if you were God, why would you allow that to happen? Such terrible destruction. Is this just God saying, you know what? Since you didn't, you didn't want to follow me. You didn't obey me. You didn't believe in me. I'm, I'm just going to destroy. I'm going to let them destroy you. Is that what God is doing? Why would mm -hmm. God allow such terrible destruction of the temple? Knowing that it's going to discourage the people. They're going to reject him. They're going to ask questions. They're going to be wondering, why does God allow this to happen? And how do, why does God waiting so long that people are saying, ah, we don't even believe Jesus is coming back now? Why does he do that? Um, <laughs> it's like a parent. <laughs> uh, After talking to a child so many times mm, and telling them so many times mercy to do something, at some point, <laughs> punishment has to exist. <laughs> well, well. So God sometimes allows certain things to happen to get our attention. Mm. Mm. I, I, I also think like we studied last week and we were just saying that um, there had to be no doubt left 
that Jesus was who he said he was. Mm, and he was loving and kind and wonderful because the enemy had already tried several things already, like we just talked about, to discourage and 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 he did that in heaven as well. So I, I believe that every doubt had to be banished, that Jesus is God, that he loves us. And you know, if we if that happens, then sin won't rear its ugly head all over again. Right. And not only that, if you think about it for a second, you remember we just read that Jesus is weeping over the temple, right? Over the people, right? Mm-hmm. He's crying over the people because they don't believe him. They don't believe, you know, what he said. Um, he's lived a perfect life, right? He died mm-hmm. in our place, was resurrected to the heavenly temple. So what kind of purpose did the the the, the earthly temple serve? What kind of what 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 what, what was the need for it anymore? There was no need anymore for the earthly temple. No, not for the earthly temple. It was right. So Satan, here's here's what happens. Satan thinks he's going to destroy where God used to have his presence. Oh wow! And God let him do it. Why? Because I don't need that no more. Right. I've already I've already won the victory. So if you want to do that and destroy a building that I'm not even using, go for it. And wow. he's got people still thinking that this temple is going to be rebuilt. <laughs> but Satan's, Satan's saying, you know what, see, I told you, it ain't going to happen. <laughs> exactly. And he's using it to his advantage to try yeah. to keep as much doubt and, yeah. and unclarity. When God is saying, man, do what you want. I've already overcome. That temple serves no purpose anymore. Right. The temple on the earth serves no purpose anymore. Jesus has died. He's been resurrected. He's up in the heavenly temple now, and he's taking care of his business. That's not necessary anymore. I already have my sanctuary in heaven. I have the temple in heaven. And yeah. what Satan is, the reason why God let him is because he doesn't, that doesn't serve a purpose, and he's letting Satan have his way. So yeah. that we can see without a shadow of a doubt, like you mentioned a little while ago, Julie, that there will be no doubt as to why God had to do away with, with sin because if it not it would create another lucifer it would create another devil and Mm -hmm. there's some smart people on planet earth that wouldn't mind taking his place because some i I know some people who are evil in their mindsets and that thing would happen again god wants to leave no doubt and so he said man go ahead if you want to destroy that that's fine because satan in his mind he's thinking i'm destroying this because that's where god used to live God mm. used to dwell here. But he don't understand that God rose from the grave and he's got mm. his dwelling place. And God said, go for it. That's what makes you feel good. Think about this. If you remember the title of the lesson? Mm-hmm. The title of the lesson is the central issue, love or selfishness. Selfishness. Aside from what Satan is doing, because that's what he's doing. He's just showing his selfishness. Is any other selfishness visible in this story? Let's go back to Luke chapter 19, verse 47. It says, After that, he taught daily in the temple, but the leading priests, the teachers of religious law, and the other leaders of the people began planning how to kill him. Mm. Mm -mm. So not only is... Not only is... The um, Satan showing his selfishness, right? Mm-hmm. What are the religious people, the people who are the scholars and all of the big shots and all the religious people? What are they doing? The same thing. <laughs> they, they, were, they were choosing or they were, they were trying to kill Jesus because he was challenging the way they thought about religion. Mm-hmm. How dare you question us? <laughs> exactly. We're the religious teachers. We know the Bible better than you. <laughs> They could not accept, listen to me carefully, they could not accept that God would give up himself even for them. Mercy. Even the disciples, you remember when they were arguing? What were they arguing about? Who was going to sit next to Who was going to be in charge? Who were going to be the rulers? Hmm? 
And even they, they asked him out that when we discussed a few minutes ago, are you going to restore the, 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 mm. the kingdom? Are you going to do that? Give it to us? Yeah. They couldn't accept the fact that Jesus acted the way he did. The way Jesus showed power was by dying and resurrecting. They didn't understand it. That's not power in most of our eyes. Power is me pushing you to do what I want you to do. Power is me telling you what to do. Power mm -hmm. is me forcing you. That's how we see power. But in Jesus' eyes, power is, I'll let you have your way, and I'm just going to die on your behalf to show you how much I love you. That's real power. Mm. <laughs> Wow. So not That's only did Satan power. show his selfishness, the religious leaders selfishly rejected Jesus. Yeah. Because they wanted power. They wanted, they were smarter than Jesus. And the sad part is, till this day here, they still don't accept that Christ is the Messiah. And that's what I was going to just ask. Are we like those Jewish leaders? Mm. Have and we gotten to the place, yeah. listen to me carefully, friends, have we gotten to the place that we think that we could be better without Jesus? Mm, 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 mm. Yes. Not me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> because we do not believe in a Jesus who would act like that. It's so sad. And that's where society is today. We don't want a Jesus whose job is to humble himself. We want a Jesus who marches... We want a Jesus who, who retaliates. We want a Jesus who <laughs> takes over the kingdom. We want a Jesus who shows people and puts people in their place. We don't like this kind of Jesus. But we want to take part in this kingdom. But we want, but we to, want be to be part of the kingdom. the kingdom. Interesting, yeah. Yeah, mm. yeah. So he cried because he's watching his nation, his people, Reject him and act fools, sort of like the guy that was kicked out of heaven. Mm -hmm. So the Bible says he cried. And you know, you go back to, uh, to, to think of something when he was saying, you know, even the rocks recognize me and y'all don't. Mm. That's deep, you know? <laughs> mm. Even nature knows. <laughs> well, how should I say this? Well, let me put it like this. Nature is smarter than human beings, with, even with all of our educations, even right. with Google and AI. Nature is still smarter than us. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's why, you know, it always, it always amazes me when I read the story of the, the ark. It mm -hmm. amazes me that the Bible says Noah preached for 180 years. 120. 120 right? years. And nobody wanted to hear what he had to say. Then God has the animals line up <laughs> two mm -hmm. by two and seven by seven and start walking into a boat. <clears throat> I don't know. I am not a rocket scientist. I don't have any doctorate degrees from Harvard and Oxford and Yale and none. Of, I don't have none of that. I ain't that smart. <clears throat> but I am dumb enough to know that if a bunch of animals start to line up wow. and get in that boat, <laughs> that's that your taste. I was told to get into them. for 120 years that I'm following them dumb animals. Because my yeah. question is, who spoke to the animal? Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Who talked yeah. to who preached to the animal? Yeah. When I would have mm. saw that, I'm just dumb enough to say, I'm gonna get on one of these horses. And I'm going in like the man has been preaching for 120 years. Mercy. But they watched it and still did their right. own thing. Why? Because they felt they would be better off without what Jesus told them to do. And they did that until they felt the first raindrop. Yeah. Once it rained, it was too late then. It was but, over. Correct. But they and, about it. and so Jesus is crying because society has rejected him. Jesus is crying because he died for them. He showed them all he could, and yet they still didn't want to believe him. They still didn't want to surrender to him. In 2024, we have not learned anything from these disciples' days.
Mercy, mercy, God. And yet the Bible says some of them still loved. Now let's go to Acts chapter 2. And somebody yeah. read verse 42 through 44. Yeah, because now it's going to change. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and, fellow, and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs and performances of the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Hi. So remember now, Jesus is crying because the believers have rejected him. They have not believed in him. And um, years go by. Um, Pentecost comes and the Bible says they're all in one room and they're all on one accord. They finally begin to see this stuff. The Holy Spirit falls on them and they have everything in common. Why would they have all things in common? Why would they have everything in common? Well, they finally, they saw everything that had happened. It says there, they were filled with awe at all the wonders. All the believers were together. They were breaking bread, breaking bread together. They were praying together. So why not hold things in common? Sure, sure, sure. So, 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 so here's my question. Is holding property in common the rule of the Bible? Is that what the Bible teaches us? I want you to do me a favor now. Mm -hmm. Somebody find Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 14. And Greg, Julie, find Deuteronomy 19, 14. And Greg, Leviticus 25, 13 through 17. Okay. Deuteronomy 19, 14, Julie. And Leviticus 25, 13 through 17, Greg. Okay, I got Read Deuteronomy, Julie. Okay. Do not move your neighbor's boundary stones set up by your predecessors in the inheritance you received in the land of the Lord your God is giving you to possess. Right. So if you if you end up getting a pro, if you end up buying some land next to your neighbor, don't move that over. You know what? Yeah. Whatever it is, just 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 enjoy each other. You guys live next to each other. Don't worry about the line that separates y'all. Don't worry right. about that. Just enjoy each other. And then Leviticus 25, 13 through 17, Greg. It says, in the year of Jubilee. Each of you may return to the land that belonged to your ancestors. Mm. When you make an agreement with your neighbors to buy or sell property, you must not take advantage of each other. When you buy land from your neighbor, the price you pay must be based on the number of years since the last jubilee. The seller must set the price by taking into account the numbers of years remaining until the next year jubilee. The more years until the next jubilee, <laughs> the higher the price. The fewer the years, the lower the price. After all, the person selling the land is actually selling you a certain number of harvests. Show your fear of God by not taking advantage of each other. I am the Lord your God. So what do these texts teach us about private property ownership? Did God help Stay in you in your high? lane. <laughs> huh? Stay in your lane. Don't Stay in your lane. Bugs. Treat each other fair. Be mm -hmm. fair with each other. Help each right. other, be there for each other. The Old Testament is filled with rules about private property rights. Mm -hmm. Leviticus 25 shows that God placed a high priority on people retaining their property. Mm -hmm. God has always put a priority on people keeping their stuff and being fair with each other. Mm -hmm. So the text says the Holy Spirit comes and they got everything in common. They're all good neighbors. They're all taking care of each other. They're all helping each other. Now let's jump to Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. What does this teach us about property? You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet mm -hmm. your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. So what does it teach us? Don't, don't even think about taking anything from don't your neighbor. Don't take anything that belongs to your neighbor. You treat each other right. This is what the Old Testament teaches over and over and over. You guys are neighbors. Help each other. How do we explain the unusual behavior in Acts chapter 2 where it says they had everything in common? So what, what belonged to Greg was mine, and what belonged to me was Greg's. How That's, does that work? That was, well, I think that was the beautiful thing that kept the people together they were mm. they were helping each other i mean i don't i know we're going there in the rest of act when we read the whole chapter of acts 2 it shows how much 
they were caring for each other. And the strangest thing is that, that while they were running away from the enemy, it looks like they were spreading the message. Mm. The, the, they were growing. They were growing mm. by leaps and bounds. Let me ask you this, Pastor. Mm-hmm. It's, if I got to remember where it is somewhere in Exodus where it said once a year that they used to sell all their stuff mm-hmm. and split it amongst each other. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. God has always wanted for us to look out for each other. Right. Always mm-hmm. wanted us because that's what he does. That's what that's how that's who he is. He's loving. He's compassionate. He cares about everybody. So I want you to notice. I want you to get this picture because it says they all they had everything in common. Everything. Not mm-hmm. some things. The Bible says everything in common. Mm-hmm. So if Greg owned the sock store where he sold stocks and I owned the t-shirt exactly. store where I sold t-shirts and Julie yeah. sold a um she had a store that sold jeans. Greg never wanted for jeans or t-shirts. You and me and Julie never wanted for for socks. Yeah. Greg never needed system. or wanted for jeans and socks. It was a yeah. Why? Because we took care of each other. Right. right. That's what was done. Now I want you to notice this. Let's go back to Acts chapter two. Somebody read verse two. Chapter 2, verse 5, and somebody else read verse 41. Now, we don't have the time to read all 42 verses of, um, 43 verses of Acts chapter 2, but I want to look at these two and look at something. I got 41, um, Julie, if you got five. Yeah. Now there was staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And verse 41, Greg? Those who believe that Peter said <coughs> baptized and added to the church that day about 3,000 in all. Right. So I want you to get the picture here now. How many new people are in town? There's many visitors there for Pentecost. <laughs> there are people, the Bible, verse 5 says they're from all over the world. People came, right? Mm-hmm. Right, right. And on top of that, it says... Peter just baptized 300, 3,000 new people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So there's a whole lot of people there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And on top of that, new, new converts. And they're all in the same place. And the Bible says they all had everything in common. Mm-hmm. How are they going to plan? How are they going to, how are they going to pay for staying there? All of those people. In Jerusalem for an unextended. Now, some of them didn't even know they were coming. They got baptized that day. They didn't even know they were coming to stay and worship during Pentecost. Yeah. So how were they going to afford an unplanned extended stay in Jerusalem? (laughs) I guess that's when you go back to what you're saying. Everybody looked out for each other. So now let's go back to verse 45, 46, (laughs) verse 47. And and now read that again. Acts chapter 2, verse 45 through 47. Okay, Acts chapter 2. Verse 45 to 47, correct. 45 to 47. Okay. Okay. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had a need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread together in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Mm. Praise the Lord. Does this help? make sense of this new and unusual practice in the early church. All of these people are here. So what do they do? They help each other. They They split up, they sell things and split up the money and let everybody take care. They pay for everybody. Everybody's got a place to stay. Yeah. That's how it happened in the early church. Yeah, boy. That doesn't happen in most families today. Let alone the church. <laughs> Imagine if it did. Look at now. Look at verse thirty-two through thirty-five. Acts chapter four, verse thirty-two through thirty-five. This is pretty deep here now. Yes, sir. All the believers were united in heart and mind, and they felt that what they owned was not their own, so they shared everything they had. Mm. Acts chapter 4, verse 32 through 35, right? Uh Uh-huh. The apostles testified powerfully in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, 
and God's great blessing was upon them all. There were no needy people among them because those who own land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. Mm. So now I want you to wow. get this because do One you more, see 35. now? Huh? He didn't read 35. And verse 35, Greg. Okay. <laughs> kind of blanked out here. If Julie got it, you could finish that up for me. I, my, my pad and blanked put, out. And, and put it at the apostles' feet and it was distributed to anyone who had a need. Right. So we now see there's more to the story, right? right because right. we thought that it was just an emergency situation where everybody had come to Pentecost for that, that week or 10 days, right? Mm -hmm. But this shows that it's more than just, just those that week. It's still a new situation because of the new baptisms and the new people who are just getting converted. But it seems to go beyond just the visiting to come to Pentecost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> the people who are staying there who were converted and baptized, they live there, they stay there and they have to learn more about their new faith. Mm -hmm. And it says that they took care of each other. They sold mm -hmm. their goods and helped each other. They looked out for each other. And that's how the early church got started. Ain't that what we do now? <laughs> Where? I didn't hear you, Greg. I, you must have. You must have. You must have zapped out again. I didn't hear what you said. I said, "Ain't that what we do now?" I didn't hear you, Greg. I think you <laughs> zapped out again. Ain't that how we do it in society and in church today, where we all look out for each other and we take care of each other? And if there's somebody yeah. poor and we go, we sell yeah. my house so that somebody else might. Only that's how him. we do it. Mm, 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 mm. I'm, I'm gonna. I'm gonna move on to the next question. <laughs> yes. Acts chapter 5 verse 3 to 5 somebody read that for us Acts chapter 5 verse 3 to 5 then Peter said Ananias how is it that Satan has so filled <coughs> your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land didn't it belong to you before it was sold and after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have you have not lied just to human beings, but to God. And number five, when Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who had heard what had happened. Mercy. This is a sad story. Yeah. About a couple, listen to me carefully. Mm. who wanted to look more generous than they really were. Yeah. Right. That's basically what's going on. You know what? They had a piece of land and they wanted to sell it so they didn't give it to the church. And then when they sold it and saw all the money they got, they said, man, well, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm, nobody knows, knows how much we sold this for. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give this little piece here. Nobody will know nothing. They don't know, they don't know how much money I got in my taxes. They, I'm just going to give what I want to give, and I'm going to. What moral yeah. principles? Not only were they willing to look more generous than they really were, they were willing to lie about being more generous mm. than they really were. What moral principles does Peter lay out for us in these verses? You, you know, the thing is that these people, they didn't have to do that. They who should have just said, this is how much I'm going to give. It was their money. It was their property. They, But they wanted to look good in front of the other people. Now that they saw the money, they wanted to be make people think that they they were doing that, that they were being real generous. And, and, they, and they talked about it together. And together they lied before... When we think that we make a promise to God and we think we're making it to people, we're in bad shape because it's God who's going to be the, the one to give us the reward or not for what we promise. So basically, if Ananias and Sapphira were living today, they would be the people who would be giving people food and taking a selfie at the same time, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. mercy. <laughs> what I'm doing. Click, 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 click. What I'm doing. I gave this people five hundred dollars. I took this homeless guy and put him in the. They didn't have to do that because 
they had the legal and moral right to keep their property. It was theirs. Yeah. The, what they could not do was lie about their generosity. They couldn't do that. No, that's that where means. their problems came in. Cause they wanted to look better than they really were. And you see what happened to them for it. <laughs> But look how look how God took care of that. God apparently told Peter. Peter didn't know what happened, <laughs> so God went and spoke to Peter and told Peter what happened, and then Peter brought it to his face. What principles can we draw from the first chapters of Acts, chapter two? Remember three and four. What did it say? They had everything together. They everything sold it. Common. Yeah. What principles could we draw from what? we read in Acts chapters two, three, and four in living a Christian life of love. We, we got to learn to look out for each other. We got to learn to look out for each other. We got to stop but, lying you know, about how generous we really are. Think about this now. With the way we do things now, if God did to us what he did to Ananias, would yes. people change their mind about how they do things? <laughs> They got scared for a minute. If you dropped, if you, if you knew you was gonna drop dead on the spot for lying, would that change the way people do things? Mm. That should show you the love that God has had for us now. Mm. You know, I don't know if you've well, noticed, but here in the United States, there is a pattern of a group of people who give little of their own money to charity. Mm -hmm but who promote laws that require others to pay more money to the government so the government can redistribute it. Yeah. And oh, they yeah. claim moral superiority for this. Yeah. Is this like the story of Ananias seeking glory when it's not deserved? It sounds like could. Yeah. Now this is now this, this is remember this is, this is old Testament stuff. So it doesn't, I'm not talking about nobody particularly here. Um, unless the shoe fits and when you get home, tie the shoelace and you know, just <laughs> yeah. however that works for you. But the truth is we have become a society where we want people to m think that we're better than we really are more generous, more loving, more kind than we really are. And pastor, what is, what is the purpose of that? So that what I could look good, what that I can get glory. We, 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 we don't, we don't remember. <laughs> that what we have was given to us by God. It's, we, we have what we have because God gave it to us. We want to have glory when we don't deserve it. Though it sounds like somebody up in heaven, right? You want a glory. Oh, that's exactly, that's exactly where this starts. <laughs> it starts with the father of lies and cheating and murder. That's Satan. He wanted glory when he didn't deserve it. Yeah, and what like he has I done think. is because of sin and we taking on his characteristics, we yes. act just like him and we don't even know it. Wow. He's because, convinced us to do know, it just like he did. <laughs> say that again. He's convinced us to do it just like he did. He's convinced us to do it the same way he does it. <laughs> yeah. And not only that, but we're so smart today because we got all these degrees and we got Google and we got AI mm -hmm. now that will answer stuff for you. Mm -hmm. We're so smart that we've rationalized in our brains that we're actually being more like Jesus than Satan. Mercy. Uh, 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 uh. So the Bible says Jesus cried when he saw the people, the people yeah. loved. Well, the old Testament people loved each other. The new Testament people and those in this society love themselves, but they mm -hmm. love. The last thing they do is they fought. Now let's go now to Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11. And let's look at verse 32 and verse 30, 30, 32 through 34. Somebody read that for us. It's, how much more do I need to say? I would take too long to recount the stories of the faith of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Japheth, David, Samuel, and all the prophets. By faith, these people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, and received what God had promised them. They shut the mouths of lions, quenched the flames of fire, and escaped the death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned into strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to fight. Right. So, so remember, here's the story. Jesus looks at his people and he cries over who they've become. Mm-hmm. 
The Holy Spirit comes during Pentecost, and those people are the most kindest, loving. They're sharing everything with each other, right? And something continues to happen, and time goes by, and we begin to think we're more generous than we are. We're more Christ-like mm -hmm. than we are. We start thinking better of ourselves than we should instead of being that humble group who was just, you know what, we're just willing to serve and help and sell everything we got so that everybody's taken care of. Wow. And he's watching his people. And he's remember, he's crying because of watching what has happened to his people. They started off as generous and loving and compassionate and time and history shows that they became very self-centered, disingenuous, not as generous as they claim to be and even lie sometimes about being generous. Did you know that I gave so and so and so and so and so and I did and I bought the and I gave towards the and I bought the that's what's happening as Jesus looks at the people. Then we get here and now we're talking about first the followers of God who displayed great love and generosity mm -hmm. and now we're talking about mighty warriors. Can we also serve God as mighty warriors? Not just being loving and kind and generous. Can we serve God as mighty warriors, according to the Bible? According oh, to yeah. the text. They did it because of faith. God was behind, you know, these great acts of valor. Because they wanted to follow what God said, and God, right. they, they succumbed, they, they surrendered to what God had said. And so they became great because of following God. Right. Amen. Because of doing what God says. Now let's read verse 35 through 38. Women received, women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskin and goatskin, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. Wow. So now I want you to get this. This is Hebrews chapter 11, right? Uh -huh. Yeah. You know what Hebrews chapter 11 is, right? Yeah, the faith chapter. That's the that's the that's the chapter of all the faithful warriors throughout the years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there's a list of all kinds of names, all kinds of people, and here we are, and they're saying that these people were killed by lions. They're saying that these people gave of their lives. These Stone people died for death. this, huh? Stoned to death. Stoned to death. Boiled in hot water and hot oil. All kinds of That's things. Are those things listed as positive features of the Christian faith? Hmm. Are those positive features of being a Christian? What is positive is the way they retain their faith. What, what they is positive went is that in spite of all of that, they still they were held faithful. on to God's unchanging hand. Amen. Mm. Which makes what they went through a positive because you and I should not feel like because we have to go through stuff following Jesus, things might be rosy like we like to call them. Sometimes we think that because we follow Jesus, everything should be rosy. This teaches us that some of the positive features of Christian faith is being persecuted, is being... But, um, but nowhere have he told us that it's going to be easy to follow him. Right, nowhere. But that's nowhere. in our minds. We think that right. because I'm following God, everything should get easy. I should become a millionaire. I should have a thousand followers. I should be making, you know, right. I should, all of this should happen because God is, it's, God has, has, has put in favor in my life. That's how we walk and talk today. But I do so know that problem. Has, if you suffer and go through this, but what's on the other end of this is greater than you could ever imagine. Right, yeah, and that's the, where we're going. <laughs> but the problem is the I that you were talking about. You can say, I should, and I should, and I should. That was Satan's original problem. I. Mm. Right. And if you remember, in the beginning of Acts, it wasn't I, it was 
was yeah, us. it was all we, together. It was they had we, all things in common. us, yeah. all of us. I has never been in God's picture. What's the old saying? Ain't no I in team. <laughs> There's no I in team. I has never been about God's perspective of things. It's always about us and we. And that's what we haven't learned in this society. Dare I say, to venture to say that, we've actually gotten worse with this I, 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 I. Look at verse 39 and verse 40. 11, chapter 11, verse 39 and 40. What is God's goal for us? To become it's a millionaire a, on planet Earth, right? It said, all these people earned a good reputation, reputation because of the faith, yet none of them receive all that God had promised. For mm. God has something better in mind for us so that they would not reach perfection without us. Hmm. So what is God's goal for us? To become millionaires? Have big nope. houses and fancy cars and and have the most likes and followers on social media and, and get yeah. the most people? No, his promise was... Uh, <coughs> God's goal for us is to get to something better than anything we can get on planet Earth. So can we make sense of what we study today? How, does, how do we make sense? Can we come up with a rule that tells us when to fight and win and when to win by sacrificing ourselves for others? Well, if we mm. read the scriptures, we can come, we can make sense of it. <laughs> if we read the scriptures, but can, can we learn some principles from today? What can we learn? Yeah. We, I mean, we they're saying when the people were the closest and the tightest is when they looked out for each other. When self we, was not the determining factor. When me, myself, self. and I was not the most important thing in my agenda. You can look at it and say, Peter baptized 3,000. These people had nowhere to stay. And what did the crowd do? Sell everything, they sold everything, sold everything together. And made sure that everybody had a that, place to stay, place to eat, all of that. But at this point we are now, we want to keep everything we got to ourselves. This belongs to me. I got it. Yeah, and we have to remember though that our Christ is our example. So right. if we were, if we choose to follow His example, then that's something we could learn from all of this because they were humble, they were kind, all the things that Jesus did, they follow. So, so just, how can we know when to fight, like the brave warriors? and when to sacrifice ourselves for others. How do we know? Because didn't God do both? Mm -hmm. yeah, so how did. do we know that? How do we know when to do one? The Holy Spirit. By the Holy he Spirit, Spirit to guide us. Give us guidance. Because nowhere I see where it says Jesus lived in a mansion here and he was no millionaire neither. Mm. <laughs> Be careful, man. I've been to your big fancy house, Greg. No, I'm just Mercy. kidding. No, I don't have no <laughs> I'm just kidding, man. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Listen, the bottom line is that God wants us to be faithful no matter where we are. Amen. Whether you voluntarily sacrifice your possessions or yourself, mm -hmm. whether you stand up and fight through faith, or whether you suffer mistreatment because of your faith, God calls us to be faithful. Amen. And why does he call us to be faithful no matter what we're dealing with? Because he has something better in mind for us. Amen. Nothing we can accomplish down here, nothing we can gather down here is going to be comparable to what God has in store for us over there. Amen. And what a Satan has done is through deception and destruction, got us caught up in trying to look better than we really are. Feel better than we really are. Mm -hmm. think we're better than we really are. And the only way we're going to get rid of that is to choose God and his way all the Amen. time. Amen. And his way, sometimes it's love, sometimes it's sacrifice. Sometimes it's humility, sometimes it's fight by faith. 
And God will let us know when we need to do each of those in his appointed time. The question is, is it time for you to choose God's way now? Hmm. And if that's your case, if that's what you believe, why not choose God right now? Amen. And if that's you, you want to say, you know what? No matter what the situation is, whether I suffer mistreatment because of my faith or whether I have to fight because of my faith or I have to sell everything that I have to help somebody else, whatever God wants me to do, I'm going to be faithful to him. If that's you, I want you to, and you want me to pray for you that we be faithful, stay faithful. There are people out there who need us. If that's you, just raise your hand right where you are. I'm putting my hands up. I'm asking God to help me to be more faithful. God, I want to do things your way, and I want to wait for your spirit to lead, guide, and direct. If that's you, if you would, right where you are, just place your hand, put something in the comments, say something somewhere so that I can pray for you in the future. The team can get together and pray for you. Let's bow our heads as we ask God's blessing. Loving Father, we thank you so much for your goodness and your kindness. This lesson was kind of deep because mm. for a lot of us, we really think we're okay. Mercy. We're in a great place because I got this and I have that. And Lord, you've never told us that he who has the most toys wins. That's not biblical. It's not in the Bible. That's not a principle mm. that comes from your throne. Your throne is the principle of we need to love each other. We need to take care of each other. We need to rally around each other. We need to serve one another. We need to be there for one another. Lord, something has happened, and we know what it is. We're learning that there's this enemy who started a war in heaven, and he's brought it down here to earth. We're learning that the enemy is trying to get us to behave just like him. And Lord, we need all the help we can get if we're ever going to be the people you've called us to be, that we could be more like you in every circumstance, in every situation. And the only way that's going to happen is if you fill us with your spirit. So right now we're giving you permission. And I pray for every person whose hand was raised, who said a comment, who's in their home crying, who's in their home asking, Lord, I'm praying for every person who will hear this. Because you said, if we'll come to you, you will in no ways cast us away. And so we come and we ask that you would do what only you could do. And we'll be kept to give you all the honor, the glory, and the praise. Save us in spite of ourselves. For we ask it all in the master, the majestic, matchless name of our master, Jesus the Christ. And everybody who loves Jesus said, Amen. 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 And amen. Friends, I want to tell you that um. I want you to know that we're praying for you. We pray that God will smile on you and God will bless you. I hope that in the coming days, in the coming that you will surrender to what God wants for you in your life. God bless you guys. Have a great week. Next, next week's lesson, I forgot to mention that. Next week's lesson, um, light shines in the darkness. Light shines in the darkness. So no matter where you are, what you're going through. God is headed your way. Keep your head up and we'll see you again next week.